welcome everyone to Green Drinks on this very dark October night. Uh, my name is Ginevra. I am the executive director at Sustainable Woodstock. We are we're founded in 2009, and we're a nonprofit, community, and environmental action and education organization. We build on Woodstock's legacy as the birthplace of the modern conservation movement. And our vision promotes vibrant, inclusive, thriving communities where we live sustainably now and into the future. So you've come to one of our monthly green drinks events. These were created as social events to connect people with similar interests in primarily the environment, um, environmentalism, sustainability. Um, and as part of them, we invite local nonprofits, businesses, and individuals to make short presentations that highlight local sustainability initiatives. So before we get started, I just want to run through the meeting and how everything will operate. So right now we are recording. That's my double check reminder. Um, you're currently muted if you joined us. So you unfortunately uh, can't unmute yourself or speak. So if you have questions, please do type those into the chat box and then we'll ask those during the Q&A. If you're not familiar with Zoom, there should be a little chat icon. And if not, there is an icon that is dot, dot, dot more. And if you click that, then the chat option should come up and you can enter questions in that box. And then we will, well, I won't, Shelby will ask them in the Q&A section. Um, oh, another note is that if your camera is on, just be aware that we are recording and this will go to local public television access stations and also on our YouTube. So on the off chance that your window was on our recording, then your face would be in the recording. So you can turn your camera off if you desire. Um, the button that says stop video, just a note. Um, so I'm going to stop that. I think those were all my basics. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce, introduce Fran, who's with us. And she is going to kick this off. So Fran Miller is a senior staff attorney and adjunct faculty member at the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, CAFS, at Vermont Law and Graduate School, where she works on a variety of topics related to farmland access and agricultural policy more generally. She is a founder of the White Riverland Collaborative. So thank you all for joining us and thank you, Fran. Thanks so much, Ginevra, and welcome everyone. Um, as Ginevra said, I'm Fran Miller. I work at CAFS, as we call it, the Center for Ag and Food Systems at VLS. And it's really my privilege to work on the project team of the White Riverland Collaborative. And I just wanna introduce the team uh, before I get into it a little bit. I'm just gonna frame the film that we're gonna see. So with me to talk with you tonight is Shona Sanford Long. She's also a founder, we're all founders of the Land Collaborative. Uh, she's the owner of Flying Dog Farm and our anchor land steward tenant on the Tunbridge Farm that we're gonna talk about. Uh, we also have Emily Bowles. Emily is a, a Beneke environmental science graduate and leader of our forest management project. You're going to meet the rest of the team in the movie and people are here as well. But Sarah Danley is also on the project team for the collaborative. Her day job is project manager for the White River Valley Consortium. She works on housing issues. And Suzanne Long with her husband, Tim. Uh, is the longtime organic farmer behind Luna Blue in South Royalton. She is also on our project team. And finally, Shelby Calm is our staff person. Shelby does a million things for the project, including outreach, managing events, financial tracking, and just provides tremendous support. And we're all local community members in South Royalton and in Tunbridge. So, before we watch this beautiful film together, I just wanted to say a bit about the issues that the Land Collaborative was formed to address. There's so many reasons that our country needs to be doing more to support farmers who are farming regeneratively, who are using good ecological practices, respecting the land, 
and growing food and animals to feed our communities at an affordable price. This is really a public good and it should be treated as such, but that is not public policy right now. So we have to try some new things at the local level to support these farmers to be able to feed us, steward the land, combat climate change and make a living. A lot of us are aware that the cost of land is just a huge barrier for farmers without capital. Uh, according to the National Young Farmers Coalition, land access is the number one challenge facing young farmers. It's also the case, as many of us here in Vermont know, and this is true for other places around the country, dairy farmers have been hit just so hard economically and land holding dairy farms tend to be really larger parcels of land with a lot of infrastructure. So the question, one question is how can these farmers sell their land to other types of farmers, especially new and beginning farmers or those who've been disadvantaged who might not be able to use the land and the infrastructure in the same way as a dairy farmer? And what we're doing with the Land Collaborative is we're creating a model where a retiring farmer can sell their land to a community-based nonprofit that then leases the land to multiple farmers or land-based businesses who can all operate on that single parcel in a collaborative and equitable way. And then last but not least, how do we as a state with a large majority of white folks living on unceded Abenaki territory act on our core values of equity and justice and redress past injustices stemming from racism and land theft? So we created the Land Collaborative to help address these and other issues. And our model builds off of previous community land trust models that were created by civil rights activists in the 60s to hold agricultural land in a commons to be managed by local community. We really see this as a project that's hopeful in a time of just unbelievable despair. Um, and thankfully, Vermont Land Trust and Sustainable Woodstock and other organizations around the state think so too. The farm that you all will see in the film is our first project, and we're really hopeful that we can incorporate additional land into the commons model that we're implementing. So just one final note, I wanna thank the amazing filmmakers, Lisa Zimbel, who is with us here, and Evan Dunsky, her husband, who moved to Vermont in 2021 and immediately became really huge supporters of our project. And we're gonna hear a little bit from Lisa after the film. We'll hear from Shona and Emily. I'll wrap us up and then we'll do some Q and A. Shelby's, as Geneva said, gonna be monitoring questions in the chat. So please type in your questions and we'll get to them after the film. And just finally, thanks to Geneva and Sustainable Woodstock. Okay, we can start the film. Farming is so much a part of Vermont. In Vermont, it's like, what are we most proud of? Our small scale working landscape that tends the ecosystem health while feeding our communities. My name is Elaine Howe. I've lived in Tunbridge all my life so far. My father was Ernest. His father was Sylvester Heber. And his father was Charles Leroy. And his father was Sylvester Pulsiver. And as far as I can tell, he's the one that bought this farm. They figure uh, that we've been on this farm since around 1850. This is a pretty iconic farm in this town. I knew that it was transitioning. There are a lot of concerns 
I have with watching agriculture elsewhere consolidate and often go to corporate models. We are seeing this trend where a lot of dairy farms are closing. And what's going to happen to that land? It's in many cases more than 100 acres that's no longer being tended. I grew up just down the road from here on Luna Blue Farm, driving by the Howe family farm every day, and it's always been kind of a landmark. I found out that this farm was for sale. It kind of felt like I had to come look at it. The price tag at first was really high. There's a lot of infrastructure, more than she would ever really need. There's so many buildings, there's so much dairy specific infrastructure here. And for another farmer to take over that land is very difficult. It's, it doesn't go, it doesn't fit with the land that a livestock farmer needs or a vegetable farmer needs. So we need these models to say like, hey, I can come to this dairy farm and use the infrastructure that was there, use the land base that was there, care for it really holistically, and help that land stay in agriculture even beyond dairy. One solution to that is for multiple agricultural enterprises to be on a farm. We had been involved in a whole community conversation piece and some of the elements of those conversations made us think, would this farm potentially be, could it be part of a community effort? Could there be something bigger here? And we didn't know at that point, like, is this just crazy, you know? Is anyone going to be interested in this idea? White River Land Collaborative project team is all women. And there's a certain energy, a certain lack of ego that is really important to what we're doing and is leading the creation of this ecosystem, of this vision, of this new-ish, building on old models way of farming, way of relating to community, way of connecting different communities. I think it's really important that women's energy lead. We refer to this project as farmer-led and community-driven because we need the farmers' understanding of their own experiences and their own needs to be leading the vision while the community is also so deeply involved in driving the project forward. It's all about momentum. And momentum comes from leadership, practicality, big vision, step-by-step -step work. One of the things that the White River Land Collaborative is focused on is figuring out how to both compensate farmers who are retiring and create a structure so that different farmers can use the land in different ways, the land and the buildings. You can share the labor, you can share the cost, and you can make something viable that really isn't possible alone. We just started pushing this ball up the hill. Shona and Suzanne and Fran, you know, came to me trying to figure out, like, we really want to see something happen on this property. We see this as this community asset that we really want to keep owned and stewarded and managed by the community. Is there a way that the Vermont Land Trust could help us? We started negotiating with Vermont Land Trust about whether they would purchase the property and give us a lease with an option to purchase over five years and let us set ourselves up and figure out if we could, not even figure out if we could, let us do this. Let us get Shona on the land, have her be our anchor tenant, get the barn appraised, see what other land-based enterprises could come here, figure out how to deal with this issue of, in Vermont and nationally, how do we allow farmers to make a living? One of our first projects before we start doing anything with the forest has been to start working with a woman named Emily Bowles. She's a young forester and she's a member of the local Abenaki community. I've been the lead for a project of forest management that involves reintroducing native species back to the property and implementing uh, land stewardship. Her voice has really become another big part of our work. 
of understanding a little bit more of how we relate to the earth and how humans are part of this whole ecosystem that we're trying to create on this farm, that humans are just a one little piece of it. The vision for the White River Land Collaborative really is to form a new way of having a relationship with the land, to transition from, you know, a sort of consumerism taking from the land to one where the relationship's really balanced. We give back as much as we get, and the land stays healthy, and by the land being healthy, it nurtures us as well. This is why we love Emily. <laughs> Agriculture and work connected to the land is really the basis of everything that we need and the basis of our rural communities. And that relationship has been broken. People's connection to the land, people's ability to make a living off the land, and people's access to the land. So land access for the Binnicky people has historically been difficult. Um, and there's many places where um, they have a great deal of meaning to our culture that we simply aren't allowed to go on because it's private property. To us, it really feels like it's our duty to care for the land. Um, so this, the White River Land Collaborative has been really great about recognizing um, past injustices and making amends for that. So many projects start and sort of barrel ahead with the vision of one or two people without thinking about our is this a project that really has justice at the core? And that's something I see different with the White Riverland Collaborative, that from the beginning they've said, we really want to center uh, justice and equity and really think about the legacy of agriculture and land use in this country. We have started community conversations around what other services and infrastructure could be offered at this property. We have started doing a engineering assessment on the barn. We need to figure out our process for bringing more land stewards onto the farms. And then we need to put all of that together into a package to be a sustainable business plan because we're fundraising to acquire the land and after that we want this to be a self-sustaining project for the community. The Land Trust has a list of probably at any one time 250, 300 young farmers that want to connect with the land. The next generation is really interested to farm, but they can't see a way forward economically. Vermont needs our young people to stay here. We need our smart, brilliant, driven, entrepreneurial leaders to stay in the state and start their businesses and have their families and send their kids to the schools and join the select boards. That's what will make this a thriving, democratic, participatory place where people can live long term. The collaborative is a seed to help people without capital connect to the land, get proficient in business models, grow crops, learn to connect to marketplace. It's sort of like a demonstration project on what creativity can accomplish. What could go right? is an exciting question to think about what could go right at the White River Land Collaborative if they're able to pull this off and take this land from a, a farm project that was closing, you know, a dairy that wasn't able to succeed and make it a, a really thriving community center with multiple enterprises and a lot of community investment, a place that people can gather and be fed. That's really hopeful for the future of agriculture in Vermont. It will become a model that other farmers and communities seek to replicate in their towns. Ten years from now, when you drive through the Howe Bridge, you'll come to the White River Land Collaborative, and the first thing you'll probably notice is all the cattle grazing in the fields. Perhaps there's going to be some beekeeping, maybe someone's going to be doing some work with mushrooms. Past that, you'll see uh, a garden filled with amazing crops, either native species of crops or rare species we're trying to seed safe. Probably one of the things that will stand out most to me is activity. I hope there can be community gathering space. I hope there can be multiple farmers accessing the land. This barn is renovated so that this space that we're in right now is a community center. And there are art shows on the walls. And there are pop-up dinners. We'll also see a lot of people having their own small enterprises. Perhaps they're using all the outbuildings for processing their food or making products. You know, there's so many things that we can't even imagine yet that we hope this work can bring about and allow a space for. This is an example of 
a group of people trying to create, you know, the, the future of what agriculture could look like. It's addressing housing, it's addressing land access, it's addressing agriculture, it's addressing historic preservation, it is workforce development, it is equitable and inclusive access. It's everything you could really want from a funding perspective. The impact is going to dramatically outpace any investment that any individual funder makes. It is so important to our project and so important to our vision to be able to purchase the land from Vermont Land Trust, which is the current owner. Anyone who has some funds to share with this project becomes a part of what will make it thrive. I want to be part of this. I want to support this because it's one of the seeds to the future. You are investing in what farming can be, of what our country needs to do to support young farmers and allow them to be ecologically good stewards of the land. Things are changing, climate's changing, people are moving, you know, we have to get on this. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we don't have a lot of time to start changing these big systems. No one knows what the future is going to hold and no one knows what the right answer is going to be. But what we do know is that the current way we're doing things, whether it be climate-wise or social-wise, it's not working. To have an alternative land ownership option that this group may be able to provide both in Vermont and beyond could be an incredible step forward. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lisa Zimball. I made this film with my husband, so I probably shouldn't say this, but I get really excited watching this film. Um, <laughs> as a filmmaker, I believe in the power of storytelling to create change. And I am so inspired by these women and this immense project that they've undertaken. Um, and I have the honor to introduce you to Shona, um, who is really, I think of Shona as a Renaissance woman. Like she knows so much about everything and works so hard, you know, by herself with others um, and just, you know, does a beautiful job taking such good care of her animals and such good care of the land. So hi, Shona. Um, <laughs> why don't you pop on and, and give us a little bit of your story and how you got to the White River Land Collaborative Project. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, so yeah, as you saw in the film, I own uh, own and run Flying Dog Farm. Um, it's a certified organic uh, regenerative livestock farm and now based on the land collaborative property. Um, I grew up 
just down the road um, on my family's small diversified farm in South Royalton. Um, but I didn't really grow up thinking that I wanted to be a farmer. I mean, it was always this kind of this integral part of my life. Um, but not something I was really thought about as a career that I wanted to pursue. Um, I ended up going to Middlebury College and kind of fell into studying biology. I, I thought I was more interested in international studies or languages or um, maybe environmental studies, but really realized there that I, I was really interested in biology and ecology and kind of more closer study of the natural world. And through that experience, um, both just living at Middlebury and kind of being away from the farm and also diving deeper into studying ecology and also learning about kind of the world of conservation, um, I came back around to really appreciating um, the farm that I grew up and on and really realizing how important farming and agriculture was to me. and. Um, uh, after Middlebury, I ended up working on a, a farm in upstate New York. And then um, uh, I kind of knew I was more interested in the livestock side of farming. That was really just where my my passion was falling. Um, I ended up working in a butcher shop in New York City for a little while and a cattle ranch out in New Mexico. And then um, was there for the first few years of a livestock farm in Connecticut. Um, and then as I was you know, really developing my career in farming, I would come back and visit my family's farm. And at a certain point, it just felt like, um, like I should be involved more and be here um, doing something with my family's farm. Um, so in 2018, my husband and I moved back um, to Vermont um, and started kind of trying to figure out what that might be, what that might look like. Um, and, um, you know, it was a, it was a process of trying to figure out how, how we might fit into my parents' farm and this community and where our place was. And, um, we actually ended up almost, almost leaving Vermont. Um, but in the spring of 2020, we decided, um, that I would buy the livestock from my family's farm, beef cattle, and a few pigs and sheep that they were raising at the time and start my own farm, which is now Flying Dog Farm. Um, and initially that was based on on Luna Blue and a few other properties that I was grazing, that I was using for pasture. Um, and one of the things I knew right off was that I really needed access to more pasture land. Um, just the land that I was grazing just wasn't enough acreage to make a economically viable business um, to raise the number of animals that I knew I needed to, to try to make a viable business. And I also wasn't really in a financial position to, to be buying land. So that was kind of a conundrum that I was in of how could I build this business and, you know, think about staying in this community um, without, without having that land access or without having that capital to, to purchase land. Um, and in the fall of 2020, we actually found out that this farm was, was for sale. And as I said in the movie, I just felt like I had to come look at it, even though, even though I didn't, I couldn't even really imagine buying a property at that time. Um, and we came to look at it and just realized that, that there was no way that I could afford it as I kind of knew. Um, but we, we had my, my mom and I, Suzanne and I had been involved in some different community conversations and about some, some other needs in the community um, needs like community gathering space, um, the desire to preserve farmland and for people to reconnect to the farmland um, and to each other. And, um, so we brought this idea to Fran and Sarah, um, and then it just has really grown from there. I think we've, everyone that 
that we've brought this idea to, especially in, in the early, in the early days, I think we were always surprised at how excited people were and how ready people were to, to, to kind of jump on board. And um, even though it's a complicated project and there's so many pieces to figure out still, um, but we've just had so much support and excitement along the way as we develop this, um, this project. And I think um, just for me, it's really given me the opportunity to build a farm that I would have otherwise been able to. And, and at the same time, really dig into that community aspect of, of what it means to steward the land in community connected to, you know, other people that want to be on this land want to know what's happening um, and want to be involved. Um, so I'm happy to dig more into things as we go into questions. Um, but I think I'll pass it back to Lisa to introduce Emily. Thanks, Shona. Can you tell us yeah. how many animals you have right now? <laughs> uh, I can, no, it's always I can different, give a rough, yeah. yeah. So right now I have about 20 um, cows uh, on the farm that will be bred. So that's the adult female cows and then they um, calve each year. So their offspring, um, yearlings and two-year-olds. Um, and then I have um, 10 sows and right now we have um, 34 little tiny piglets that are about two, three weeks old and, you know, 15 that are a couple months old and then um, 15, 10 or 15 left that we've been slaughtering through the fall. And then we have about 20 ewes and, and their lambs from this year. Um, and they, they, um, the farm is all based on this property, but I do continue to graze um, three other properties in the area to have enough grazing. Amazing. Um, hence, Shona works 24-7, like literally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next you're going to hear from Emily, um, another amazing member of this project. Uh, so Emily, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, you know, what this land and this project means to you through an Abenaki lens. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you to everyone who joined us here tonight. So glad you took the time to learn more about this project. Um, it really means a lot to me. I knew from a fairly young age that I really wanted to do some sort of work that involved forest and the land. And at that time, I really wasn't sure what that meant. Um, I got pulled towards environmental science fairly quickly, but there was always this part of me who felt I at some point was going to have to live between two worlds um, because sometimes conventional science doesn't take into account principles of my Beniki culture and how us native people feel we need to take care of the land. So it was kind of difficult going through college knowing that there was going to be times I might have to compromise um, my own principles or thoughts trying to do something good to help the land. And then the land collaborative formed and not only were people supportive but they encouraged me to take on this forest project and come up with a new way to work with the land and to do it in a way that really allowed me to bring into my own abeniki and cultural beliefs and understandings and combined that with what i had already learned about conventional science practices so that we could really have a better well-rounded way of looking at the land and caring for it and that's really what the forest project is all about us listening and learning from the land itself and I, I couldn't do the forest project without Rudy. <laughs> you guys saw him in the video. He's just an amazing person. He's a watershed he's a watershed scientist, but he's also so much more in the community. He wears so many different hats. He referees soccer. He plays music. He takes school groups out to the river to teach them about it. And he really felt 
it was so important that a part of this project was education and community outreach. So that's um, also a really important cornerstone to us is we want the community to be involved with understanding what we're doing in the forest and we want to share what we learn. We often bring in experts in other fields such as ecology, biology, or natural communities. And they teach us what they can see and understand about the land. And then we take what we've learned and we bring that to com the community and give them updates and take them out onto the land and explain to them what we're learning about and at times even show them how they can do the same. And like Shona said, the the enthusiasm is just remarkable every time. You know, I wasn't really sure what people would think about this project, but the support and the interest from the community, it, it really gives us what we need to keep going because we see that there's a need for projects like this and that people have a desire for there to be new ways to do things. With so much going on in the world, the climate change and social issues, it's became so important to have something that gives people hope and makes us feel like a community again. And the White River Land Collaborative has just really shown that if we come together, we can create something new and something better that works for everyone, including animals in the land. This is why we love Emily. I think that's what Rudy <laughs> said in the movie. <laughs> um, thank you, Emily. And now we're going to, Fran, have you um, bring it home. You know, this event comes with a call to action. Uh, so, Fran, tell us what that is. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for being here. We're so grateful for you and for your interest in the project. So as I said, I'm an attorney and I work with the, with VLS at the law school and I work with people around the country who really are asking kind of similar questions as we are. How do we make farming viable for young farmers like Shona who go into it without a whole lot of capital? You know, how do we address injustices that have occurred against Emily's people and many others in America regarding land access? And how do we allow for multiple enterprises on one parcel of land, especially in places like Vermont, where dairy farms are going out of business, they have significant amounts of land and infrastructure that are just too much for one farmer. So you've seen in the movie, you've heard from our wonderful project team, um, we have these core values of inclusivity and collaboration and historic preservation, connecting community, listening to the land in new ways. So our call to action, as Lisa mentioned to you all, is to partner with us. Uh, we're really grateful to the more than 200 generous donors who've contributed to our project, both financially and otherwise. Um, as I say in the film, in order to make this vision a reality, we have to purchase the land from VLT, from Vermont Land Trust, and we've raised 150000 of the 700000 that we need to buy the land. We've raised another 150000 for operating expenses and to carry out our activities as well. So we've really just gotten enormous community support. And we're looking for leadership donors who have the capacity to make a significant difference in the purchase of the farm. If you are those people, any of you, I would love to talk to you more about the project. And I'm going to put my email in the chat and please be in touch. We're talking with foundations and individual donors, of course. So if you know people to introduce us to, that would be fabulous. Are there people you know who should see the film? Ginevra, thank you so much for giving us this audience. We're looking to bring it out in more places. Um, people can donate or also we need lots of expertise to help us move forward in our vision. And just to close, I would say that many hands make light work. So whatever you can give and whoever you might introduce us to, whoever you talk to about these issues, it all matters. Shelby's going to put the online donation link in the chat. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat as well. Please reach out. I'd love to and we'd love to follow up with all of you and see if you're interested in how you might support the work. Um, we do welcome people to the farm. 
Um, we are hoping to have one more event this fall where Emily will lead us on another walk in the forest. The last one was really quite something. And we will surely be in touch with that. And now we can do questions if there if anybody has any. And if folks just want to put quest, start putting questions in the chat. Okay, someone asked, is, they're curious who is farming and using the land right now? That is Shona and Flying Dog Farm is on the land. Um, and Emily is leading our project in the forest. And we are in the process of determining what our, proce our process for bringing more collaborators onto the land and into the buildings. So Shona's operation um, covers a lot of the pasture and some of the outbuildings. There is a small patch of land that is possible for herbs or vegetables. And then there is a big, uh, you saw it in the movie, 1914 historic barn that um, our plan is to renovate and to include businesses, land-based businesses in there. Thanks, Fran. We have another question, which is uh, asking about the living situations on the land and the farm. Should I just go for this, Shona, or you want to? Sure, either way, I can always jump in if you. So there's one large house uh, currently on the land that Shona and her husband and several farm workers live in seasonally. Um, we have the possibility of building one more living space. The There's 60 acres of the land that is subject to a conservation easement owned by Vermont Land Trust, and so we can't build. Uh, but there's a little bit of leeway because there used to be one house that was on the property, which, I don't know, fell down. <laughs> and uh, we have some possible negotiation to do to see if there's another space that we can put that uh, put a house on. Folks, have any other questions? Don't be shy. Now's your chance. <laughs> I wonder if um, Suzanne or Sarah wants to jump in with anything else that maybe wasn't mentioned or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've presented uh another question. Um would be would we be interested, Emily, I think this is a question for you. Would we be interested in a grove of pawpaws? It sounds like somebody has a bunch of pawpaw seedlings. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, maybe not at this time. We're still working really hard to get to know what plants are already on the property. Um, so we're kind of laying our intentions to reintroduce plants until we're really understanding the ecology that's going on there currently. Um, but if we ever do, we will reach out to you. <laughs> and thanks so much for offering. I wanted to also mention that volunteer opportunities usually come around every year. So if you just want to volunteer to help out with the project in that way, we really appreciate it. And it's a great way to get to know the community. And the lands. It's a really beautiful place up there. And every time I go out on it, I'm just constantly amazed. And I learn something new or find a new plant. And it's, it's really beautiful. And I wish everyone would have the opportunity to see it. 
We have another question, which is who should people email to get on the volunteer list? And you can email either Fran or me. My email I just put in the chat. It's Shelby at White River Land Collaborative dot com. Um, or you can email info at White River Land Collaborative dot com. That goes both to me and Fran as well. Yes, I would uh, just jump in and say this is Suzanne from the Blue Farm. Um, you can also email Shelby to get on the newsletter, which is what Sarah is saying. <laughs> um, that's a great way to know what events are happening when. Um, Shona and Hugo also did a, some really fun um, burger nights at the farm this summer. They just started getting that going and that was a great way to bring community together and um, just be on the farm. And so that's just getting on that list will let you know what's what's happening. And just one quick little thing, uh, Ginevra, the, the sheep that uh, started Shona's flock came oh. three ewes from Steve Wetmore. So just a little link to you. <laughs> that's beautiful. I had no idea. That's lovely. He was my uncle for anyone who's curious. <laughs> And I live in his that's house now. <laughs> um, that's so cool. Yeah, I've got to stop by and see it all. You all are such really um, poetically inclined speakers and have obviously thought so deeply about this project. So it's just a joy both watching the film and then kind of seeing you speak in person as well. So I really do want to thank you. And this is great info. I can send out to folks afterwards in terms of how to get on the newsletter and people to email about volunteering. Um, can send that out to all of our folks who are registered. Um, are there any last thoughts or questions? Hmm. The more the merrier. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Like, and there is Geneva, thank you for saying that. There's just, there's a lot of excitement about the project in the community and amongst us. And so we really encourage everybody. And I see some, there are some recognizable names on the call. So thank you for your support and um, come by. It's a beautiful spot, as you could see on the, on the uh, movie. You really can. Yeah. Okay. Well then, I think I think that wraps us up for the evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I really am thrilled to meet you virtually, and I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Thanks, Geneva. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. To thank you. Thank you.